Baldur's Gate 2 is one of the only 80 hour single player games I've played that feels too short. Baldur's Gate 2 didn't take 80 hours to complete because it's big, but because it's densely packed full of interesting characters to meet and stories to uncover. I completed quests because I wanted to experience the narrative combat and puzzles on offer, not to make a percentage bar slowly tick up while I clear a bunch of messy icons from the screen. The world of ARM is smaller than the Sword Coast from Baldur's Gate 1. Bioware didn't just make the sequel bigger for the sake of it, and the lack of filler content is refreshing compared to many modern games. Baldur's Gate 2 doesn't pad player time by making you clear out a certain number of camps or find hundreds of feathers. In 2018 I spent around 60 hours playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey and it would have easily been 80 hours if I'd played the DLC, which I paid for but never bothered downloading. With Odyssey I was bored after around 30 hours. Odyssey is a long game because it's a big game, not because it's a dense one. If you stick to the main story path the content is relatively interesting, albeit a little repetitive, but the real problem comes when you want to reach level 50 for the true ending. The quest to level 50 is a slog that sees you doing the same thing over and over again, mainly clearing out enemy camps, and the large world looks a lot less interesting once you see how many of the assets are repeated, again and again. I can't tell you how many times I climbed this identical building to activate a waypoint. In no way did Odyssey justify its 50 to 80 hour runtime. Few games justify anything over 25 to 30 hours, and I actively dread hearing publishers boast about how long their new game is, without ever making it clear why it is that long beyond a desire to keep selling microtransactions for months. The more I played Odyssey, the less I enjoyed it, and you'd have to pay me to play it again. That is absolutely not the case with Baldur's Gate 2, which if anything should be longer, not shorter. I want to play the entire game again one day. Okay, not anytime soon to be fair. The experience was somewhat exhausting and there are a lot of great games out there that I haven't even played once, but even if I never do replay it, I at least want to. You make plenty of meaningful choices throughout the game, so a second playthrough could be substantially different. Plus there were still loads of quests I didn't complete, even in 80 hours. And I want to play those extra quests and make different decisions. I want to know what happens if I side with the vampires instead of the shadow thieves, and I want to see the companion missions for evil characters like Edwin and Dawn. Shadow of Arm's major expansion, Throne of Baal, is somehow even denser and should be a full sequel and not just an expansion. The attempt to cram Throne of Baal's story into an expansion harms the overall experience a touch. Still, overall I prefer games that leave you wanting more to games that massively overstay their welcome. It's shocking how much there is to do in Baldur's Gate 2 and how much of it is genuinely rewarding, due to the quality of the writing and not addictive gameplay loops and fancy box opening animations. The sheer volume of interesting story and gameplay content in Baldur's Gate 2 is all the more remarkable when you consider that it released in September 2000, less than two years after the release of Baldur's Gate 1 in December 1998. We've seen a few times during this series how quickly these isometric CRPGs can be knocked out, especially once an engine is in place. However, although short development times were relatively common, this should not diminish the achievement. I dread to think what the working conditions were like as everyone crunched to get the product complete and deal with all the bugs. The density of Baldur's Gate 2 compared to its predecessor wasn't an accident. Back in the late 90s, Bioware did post-project reviews after every game to take a long hard look at what went right and what went wrong. Nowadays these post-project reviews are done by Jason Schreier and published on Kotaku. Most of the problems with the original Baldur's Gate stemmed from a lack of time with the game and the Infinity engine being developed at the same time. Bioware identified that the level design process was overly convoluted and had too many steps to efficiently create new environments. The end result was levels that were overly simple, such as the many repetitive wilderness areas that didn't have much in them. For Baldur's Gate 2, Bioware implemented an 8 stage process for creating game levels, and set out to make all of them memorable instead of just having a handful of good ones. Bioware specifically wanted questing to be less about item delivery and more about the excitement of visiting new locations with multi-part quests and puzzles to be a key part of the experience this time around. As you'll see in this video, Bioware largely met the overall goal of improving level design, both in terms of the visuals and questing. 
but there were problems with the new pipeline such as keeping documentation up to date and the like, and Bioware ended up determined to improve integration between the various teams, such as programming art and QA, which it implemented with Neverwinter Nights. After identifying problem areas from the first game, Bioware created a desired feature list for the sequel, such as a leap to 800 by 600 resolution, support for 3D graphics cards, and improvements to the UI. In addition to the technical stuff, there was also the introduction of the now infamous Bioware romances, alongside character interaction described as being on par with Final Fantasy, and definitive good and evil paths to allow for more roleplaying. Baldur's Gate may have been Bioware's first major release, but it's the sequel that features the elements that would go on to define Bioware and make them beloved the world over. Other changes had to be made to properly reflect the higher level D&D experience that the sequel would be centred around. Spell limits were increased to level 9 and we finally get to see dragons. To make the dragons feel massive, Bioware had to make the characters slightly smaller to fit more of the monster on screen while letting the player see what's around them. The dragons still barely fit on screen and you feel appropriately insignificant in comparison to these glorious beasts. Visually, Bioware wanted to go for a more Byzantine look for Arm, which is the region located directly to the south of the Sword Coast in the continent of Faerun. The Byzantine inspiration is evident in the capital city of Athkatla, with its circular marketplace and domed buildings. However, once outside the city, the distinction is a little less apparent. Although Baldur's Gate 2 is nearly 20 years old at this point, it's worth noting that the Infinity engine was already starting to look a bit dated in late 2000. Less than two years after the release of Baldur's Gate 2, Bioware released Neverwinter Nights on a new engine and the difference is huge. In an interview with GameSpot, Ray Muzika had to defend the decision to use the same engine in Baldur's Gate 2, and you can tell the interviewer expected more substantial changes. They asked Muzika why Bioware decided to use the two-year-old Infinity engine for the sequel, as if two years was shockingly old for a game engine, and they go on to ask what changes are being made to ensure Baldur's Gate 2 doesn't look dated. Thankfully, the dated graphics didn't stop Baldur's Gate 2 being a huge hit. It sold around 2 million copies and the expansion Throne of Baal sold around 500,000. GameSpot and IGN gave Baldur's Gate 2 role-playing game of the year awards and it won GameSpot's Reader's Choice Award. Given this level of success, you might be surprised at the absence of a Baldur's Gate 3. A common rumour is that Throne of Baal was originally going to be Baldur's Gate 3, only for it to get condensed into an expansion because Bioware was about to lose the licence for AD&D 2nd edition. Wizards of the Coast had just released the 3rd edition and wanted all D&D products to move on from the 2nd edition. The theory that Throne of Baal was supposed to be Baldur's Gate 3 is so widely and confidently asserted that I took it as a given before I had played any of these games. However, when researching for this video, I could not find a single shred of evidence that this was the case, and in fact there's evidence that strongly suggests this theory is false. I'll discuss Baldur's Gate 3 nearer the end of this video when the context makes a little more sense, but I wanted to get that first part out of the way given how common the theory seems to be. As you can see from the footage, I'm playing the Enhanced Edition version of Baldur's Gate 2, as published by Beamdog back in 2013. The release was delayed a few months due to a contractual issue Beamdog had with publisher Atari. The Enhanced Edition of Baldur's Gate 1 was briefly removed from sale through Beamdog's channels, and a critical patch was delayed. I can't find any concrete information about the reasoning behind the dispute, however given that Atari continued to sell Baldur's Gate on Steam, it appears the dispute was around publishing rights across the various platforms. Whatever the problem was, it got sorted out quickly enough for Baldur's Gate 2 to be released just a few months later. All the Beamdog Enhanced Edition games are due to be published on PS4 and Xbox One this year by Skybound Games. Interestingly, Beamdog considered releasing the games on console during development and were even contacted by Sony, with a view to getting them on the PlayStation systems. However, Trent Oster ultimately decided against it, claiming that a controller would require too big a redesign of the systems. I'm inclined to agree, however a lot of CRPGs have made their way to consoles in recent years, as have grand strategy games like Stellaris, so it'll be interesting to see how Skybound Games handles the ports. PC will always be the platform of choice, but anything that brings these games to a larger audience is a good thing in my book. Hopefully Skybound will fix the bugs in the Enhanced Edition. It's crazy that nearly 6 years and some major patches after its initial release, the Enhanced Edition of this 20 year old game still has bugs. Some of them are fairly major, like when I got stuck in a dream sequence. I killed the dream version of Saravok as required, but the dream wouldn't end. I even went as far as editing the .lua file to add in the cheat engine to follow a few suggestions I found online, but none of it worked. 
The solution ended up being to kill my own familiar, because for some reason the existence of my pet was stopping the scene from finishing. Somehow the pathfinding is a bigger issue than in any of the previous games and it wasn't exactly good in those. I genuinely cannot believe how bad it is here. Characters constantly go off in the wrong direction and get stuck. Every time I wanted the group to move I had to watch them the entire way because I couldn't trust them. It was an absolute nightmare. One thing I didn't notice until after completing the game and going back to record some lost footage is that if you have the cheat engine on you can instantly teleport your team around the map, saving all that walking time. Believe it or not, despite my complaint about the pathfinding, I don't recommend you do this. Walking around is a big part of being an adventurer. Without it you won't run into all those random encounters and you'll miss out on quests. Plus, once you have Cheat Engine on and you're using one keyboard shortcut, you might be tempted to use others, and yeah, that will ruin the game for you. Only turn Cheat Engine on if you have great self-discipline. There are also minor glitches, stuff like the artwork not lining up properly leading to distracting flickering, but I can live with that. To be fair to Beamdog, bugs have always been a huge part of these Infinity Engine games. Apparently 15,000 bugs were found for the original release back in 2000. Bioware admitted that QA was rushed for the original release and it promised to be more on top of QA for future projects, which is why Bioware now releases completely bug free games. As regular viewers will know, one of the major goals of this series is to track my progress as I navigate the murky world of AD&D combat for the first time. I knew absolutely nothing about AD&D when I first played Baldur's Gate, and even having played that one, plus Siege of Dragonspear, Planescape Torment and Icewind Dale, I still feel like I've barely scratched the surface of what's possible with both battle tactics and the sheer variety of options available. The good news is that I continue to learn something from every game, and most importantly I'm happy with the level I'm playing at. I'd love to be better of course, but I'm having a good time overall. I can't claim to love the combat, but I enjoy it at times and it's not a chore anymore. I know at least one school of gaming theory subscribes to the belief that games can be fun and not just ball bustingly hard. When it comes to the difficulty I now feel comfortable playing on core rules setting, although there are a bunch of caveats to that. Core rules is the difficulty one step above normal and one below hard. When I say I'm comfortable playing on core rules I mean I'm comfortable playing the way I like to play. That means I'm at a level where general mobs of enemies are relatively easy and I don't need to micromanage every single battle I stumble upon. Whereas major enemy groups such as those with mages on hand or any boss fights require me to stop and plan things a bit. It doesn't matter if I die a fair few times so long as I stumble my way through eventually. I take a fair bit of damage with this relatively casual approach so I stop and rest whenever I feel like it to get back all my health and spells. I experimented with hard difficulty a bit. Hard doesn't feel beyond me in the same way it used to but it doesn't elevate the experience either. Hard difficulty simply buffs enemy health and the damage they deal so fights take slightly longer. For the most part every fight I could get through on core rules I could also handle on hard. I just took more damage and had to use more spells which in turn meant resting more often. That said there's no way I'd be able to complete Baldur's Gate 2 on hard or at least I wouldn't be able to complete Throne of Bar because things got pretty damn challenging near the end of that expansion. From Baldur's Gate 1 to Baldur's Gate 2 I've moved from not understanding higher level play at all to at least getting the gist of it even if I still don't have the skill and patience to do it myself. I'm going to detour a bit and make a quick comparison to fighting games. I understand Mortal Kombat 11 at a mechanical level and often watch high level play. I know when people have made mistakes and can spot input errors. I can't execute any of this myself of course but I get it. Now compare that to Smash Bros Ultimate where I technically know the moves but I don't properly understand the mechanics. In Smash Bros Ultimate I can't spot the difference between a good player and a great player. The difference between Mortal Kombat 11 and Ultimate is that when I take a beating in MK11 I want to rematch immediately to see if I can improve in the matchup. If a zona kept me out I try and figure out how I can get in close. If I dropped combos I go back to the lab to improve. I'll look up random videos and guides to get tips for my next game. If someone keeps spamming the same move I can figure out how to beat them. Now when I go online in Smash Brothers, I get absolutely destroyed and I don't really know why. I generally quit out and feel a bit demoralised. This isn't meant to be a criticism of the game although Mortal Kombat 11 does have better tutorials than Ultimate. For whatever reason I understand how Mortal Kombat 11 works and what I'm supposed to do. Whereas in Smash Brothers, I consider myself fortunate if my character is facing the right way when they try to hit someone. 
Most importantly of all, I don't think I've played a single match of MK11 where I haven't learned something, from improving the timing of get-up attacks to the frame data for one specific attack from an opponent. I've played, I don't know, over 50 online matches of Ultimate, and I can't think of a single thing I've learned. It's like trying to learn a language by watching TV in that language, but you don't speak a single word and aren't getting any outside tuition. Taking a beating back in Baldur's Gate 1 felt like when I play Ultimate. It could be utterly demoralising, especially during some early abandoned playthroughs that went hopelessly wrong. I was so clueless about the fundamentals I couldn't learn from defeat. Things have changed a lot since then and playing Baldur's Gate 2 is more like Mortal Kombat 11 where I learn from my mistakes. Beatings still happen and they do send my confidence back a few pegs. In my Icewind Dale video I discussed how I was struggling to up my game from the basics to the more advanced stuff. And as we'll see, a couple of endgame battles still had me absolutely stumped. I ran into a roadblock early on in Baldur's Gate 2 when I went up against a bunch of vampires. I replayed the fight multiple times with no improvement and I must admit I thought, here we go again. Every time I play one of these games I start with a degree of confidence that this will be the time it all clicks and it never takes long before I'm brought back down to earth. Vampires have a powerful attack called Energy Drain which reduces the XP of the victim by two levels, resulting in reductions to total HP, attack power, Thaco and well, basically everything that's useful. Energy Drain is devastating, turning the toughest tanks into the weakest glass cannons, and worst of all it can't be removed by resting. Being the entirely unobservant person that I am, I managed to get a couple of companions inflicted with energy drain before even realising, and had to take on a huge mob with effectively half a team. I guess you could say the energy drain hit me personally as well. My desire to complete the game on core rules difficulty drifted away as I came to the realisation that once again I would have to lower the difficulty and fudge my way through an encounter without properly understanding it. And that's exactly what I did. I won the fight through sheer perseverance and left the area. After doing a bit of research online I discovered three things. One, you can cast a spell called Negative Plane Protection that protects against Energy Drain. Two, the effects of Energy Drain can be removed by a cleric with a Restoration spell or a similar scroll. And three, I really should look this stuff up online more often. I do my best to stay within the game when playing, especially when I'm later going to do a video about it, but there are simply far too many spells for me to keep in my head, especially once everyone can cast the level 9 stuff. These spells have in-game explanations, but those explanations often use terms that then require you to look them up somewhere else, and before you know it you've forgotten what you were trying to understand in the first place. Many of you are probably wondering how I managed to miss such an obvious spell like negative plane protection in the first place. I'm not 100% sure myself, but I have an idea how it happened. I've long known about the no alignment spell, which lets you know the alignment of any given creature unless they roll a saving throw against it. It couldn't be simpler, and the game explains it in a couple of sentences. My issue was simply that I could never think of any use for the spell. I understood the importance of alignment for yourself and your party, but not so much for enemies. 99% of the time you know whether or not you should kill something or someone. As a character on the good end of the alignment spectrum, I wouldn't kill people unless I had no choice. Well, mostly. Knowing their alignment wouldn't help me much. I guess you could use this spell on NPCs to see if they're trying to deceive you, but I'd rather have more combat useful spells on hand. Some weapons do extra damage to certain alignment types, but that was rare enough to not be worth worrying about, and besides, in the heat of battle, I'd rather use a buff than waste time discovering enemy alignment. None of this was a particularly conscious thought process. In those early days of picking and choosing between the hundreds of available spells, I simply decided to prioritise those that sounded interesting and which I actually understood, over those which seemed even more nonsensical than the rest. Flaming swords make sense. I can understand how conjuring a horde of monsters might make things easier, and the ability to cure wounds seemed self-explanatory. All this alignment stuff on the other hand, nope. I wrote it off as something only hardcore players needed to worry about. And I guess there was a similar leap of logic that led to me skipping over the negative plane protection spell. It sounded like one of those things that was way beyond my level, and when I first looked at it, the spell served no purpose for me. I put it to one side and continued to ignore it, even though the description clearly states that it protects against energy drain spells from vampires, who, being undead, are on the negative plane. With a bit more careful reading I was able to load out my cleric with negative plane protection and restoration, and get through the vampire infestation without having to constantly leave to go back to a temple and seek a cure. I'm glad I did because vampires come up quite a lot. I had to figure them out sooner or later. 
I've come to accept that a one size fits all group of spells isn't the best way to approach major encounters. I'm never going to switch up spells for every encounter, but when areas have a theme such as the undead or trolls that need to be finished off with fire or acid, it makes sense to be prepared. I still struggle internally about just how much I want to micromanage my spellbook for every encounter. However, generally it's clear when you should prepare for a specific eventuality, and I'm not stubborn enough to ignore all the obvious clues. As you can imagine, given the lessons I learned early on, I was extra careful to meticulously read all the spell descriptions from here on out, and found a few new interesting ones to try, like the Find Familiar spell. This is a low level spell that summons a flying buddy to fight alongside you and provide a few extra hit points. I've no idea why I didn't use this before. It sounds brilliant and I felt like a better player for widening my spell usage. I read the spell description thoroughly, weighing up the benefits and costs of each spell I added to my spellbook. I read so thoroughly that I completely missed the minor bit of small print, which mentioned that every time your familiar dies you lose one point of constitution permanently. I lost four points before I noticed this. With such a keen eye for detail, you can see why I don't work as a lawyer anymore. Fortunately, for all the spells I made a mess of using, there were some that proved incredibly useful. Mordenkainen's sword summons a flaming sword ally, which is as awesome as it sounds, and spells like Breach Magic and Magic Resist are practically essential this time because of all the powerful mages. As I mentioned in previous videos, I used to restart battles if any of my companions died, because I usually couldn't be bothered with the hassle of picking up their body and all their gear, plus the inventory management that typically entails, and then dragging them back to a temple to have them resurrected. Now that I have a cleric with the raised dead spell, this doesn't need to be an issue, and I don't feel like I'm cheesing the game quite so much. Unless the cleric dies, that can be a problem. As I experimented with different spells and attack types, I continued to experience frustration with the lack of feedback provided during combat. I still find it nigh on impossible to determine whether one spell is better than another given all the variables involved. There are up to six team members to keep an eye on, and if you're not pausing the action every few seconds you can easily miss crucial information such as ineffective weapons or magic resistance. If a weapon is ineffective it's not easy to figure out why. From looking online I found out that some enemies have to be defeated with certain strength weapons, plus threes for example, but I've no idea how you're supposed to figure this out by yourself. Likewise many magic attacks will fail with a simple message of magic resistance. Does this mean the enemy is immune to all magic? Have they used a magic resistance spell that can be broken with a magic dispel scroll? As with all my struggles with D&D combat, I don't doubt that the information is there somewhere for those who are more observant or patient or simply more intelligent but I found myself constantly battling a lack of information when I came up against a new enemy type that gave me problems. That said, this is coming from the same person who didn't notice that the death of a familiar led to a permanent loss of constitution, which was literally in capital letters in the description. While most of Baldur's Gate 2 was fairly manageable on core rules difficulty, I had a lot of problems with the last couple of encounters in the Throne of Baal expansion, especially the last fight. I wouldn't have been able to beat the expansion at all if it weren't for the ability to save at three separate stages during the fight, and somewhat surprisingly to rest as well. I'm amazed you're allowed to do this at all, but it certainly helped me a lot because the fight is a long slog against a bunch of tough enemies otherwise. While it ended up being too much for me, I like how the expansions introduce tough new challenges instead of just more content. The beauty of these enhanced additions is that the difficulty never has to be a problem if you don't want it to be. Story mode is still there if you need it, so everyone can experience the epic story of the Baal spawn from killing rats and candlekeep to becoming the Lord of Murder. I'd never want to discourage someone from using story mode if they need it, but I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't mention what you miss out on. As I've discussed over the course of four and a half games based on the AD&D 2nd edition rule set, there have been many temptations to reduce the difficulty, and sometimes I had to. However, I've also learned a lot, and the combat has become more enjoyable with each game. Perhaps the most satisfying aspect of keeping the combat at a challenging level is the joy you get from finding a new piece of loot. There's great gear spread out over the entirety of Baldur's Gate 2 and Throne of Baal, so finishing a huge dungeon or defeating a mini-boss often rewards you with a new two-handed sword for Keldon or a flail for my fighter mage. These weapons often come with incredibly powerful bonuses attached, such as extra damage against undead enemies or dragons. Then there are magical weapons such as the sling that doesn't need bullets or the crossbow that doesn't need bolts. You completely miss out on this reward loop if the challenge is non-existent to begin with. This applies to all the enhanced edition games I've played so far. 
However, Baldur's Gate 2 and especially the expansion Throne of Baal provide the best gear because of a combination of slow progress and higher level play, and every time I changed weapons it was a big moment. Many of these weapons have to be found in parts, often spread across tens of hours, so there's a real joy in finally putting all the pieces together for a particularly special weapon. Each weapon has its own personality and application, so even if I didn't want to use a weapon immediately, I'd keep it on hand just in case. Selling them felt like a waste. I didn't fully appreciate just how much I was enjoying the combat and how dull story mode can be until I lost a bunch of gameplay footage. Up until now I'd only ever used story mode to get through specific battles that I couldn't beat and then turned it off again. During my Baldur's Gate 2 playthrough something went wrong with a bunch of video footage and I lost 8 hours of gameplay. I had around 80 hours of footage in total so this didn't need to be a huge deal, except the footage I lost happened to be the final chapter of the base game and most of the puzzle dungeon from the expansion, both of which I wanted to specifically discuss in this video when I needed the footage. I couldn't bring myself to go through it all again. The final fight against John Arenicus wasn't too tough, but Watcher's Keep had been a brutal slog that I had no intention of repeating. It wasn't quite as tough as the final encounter in the Throne of Baal story, but it was more consistently challenging for hours at a time, and I didn't have the mental energy to do it again. I switched story mode on, but even that was boring because the fights take a while to play out, and it's effectively automated. You just sit there and watch, it's not exactly exciting. I ended up using the cheat engine which I'd already added on to deal with that bug I mentioned earlier, and I gave myself extra XP and some ridiculously OP weapons. I killed nearly everything with one hit, so if some of the late game stuff looks incredibly easy in my footage then that is why. It's also why later sections of gameplay have lower level characters and worse weapons. Not everyone finds the combat too challenging of course. Ascension, one of the popular mods for Throne of Baal, increases the difficulty of fights against bosses which many consider to be too easy. Good for them I guess. For a final example of how dense I can be, I'll point you to the time when I couldn't understand why the difficulty curve spiked so suddenly around 3 quarters of the way through the game. I'd been going along fairly comfortably, but for some reason I was getting killed by even small mobs of enemies now. I eventually noticed that many of my best weapons and armour had turned to dust after leaving the Underdark, so I'd effectively been fighting unarmed. Anyway, back to the base game. Baldur's Gate 2 starts off with the protagonist in prison. This must have been quite jarring if you'd come into the game straight from Baldur's Gate 1, which ended with you defeating your half-brother and fellow Baalspawn Saravok, and being hailed as the hero of Baldur's Gate. Siege of Dragonspear was supposed to fill in the gaps, which it sort of did but not particularly well. Most of Siege of Dragonspear is about stopping Kaelar Argent and her crusade to free her uncle from the Nine Hells. A hooded figure pops up every now and again to talk about your great destiny and all that. In the epilogue this hooded figure tricks you into killing the innocent Sky Silvershield. You end up in prison for your crimes, escape with the help of Imoen, and are then knocked unconscious to be taken prisoner again. And that's the explanation for why you're in prison at the start of Baldur's Gate 2. As explanations go it's not a particularly enlightening one. You end Siege of Dragonspear getting knocked unconscious in the woods and that's how Baldur's Gate 2 starts. All Siege of Dragonspear really does is provide some context for why you were in the woods in the first place, not why you were taken captive. The whole thing about being arrested for Sky Silvershield's murder is largely pointless because you escape and this is a separate imprisonment which doesn't appear to have anything to do with this story. The whole arrest is pointless as well. You could have been captured during any random trip through the woods. Anyway, those are flaws from Siege of Dragonspear. Overall, I'm mixed on the opening. Waking up as a captive in prison isn't a particularly novel or interesting way to open a game, it's the de facto RPG way to explain why you start with no gear, and it felt a little too similar to the opening to Planescape Torment, with Imoin replacing Mort as the person who gives you a nudge at the start and explains part of what's going on. I don't like how this opening level writes off existing characters without much thought. Jahira can be rescued from the cage nearby, but Khalid gets killed off screen, as does Dinah here. I don't take issue with killing off characters, and in fact I'd encourage it for sequels such as this one because it encourages players to try out new companions, but if you care about these characters, seeing them killed in such a nonchalant way, or more to the point not seeing them killed at all, is frustrating. Couldn't Khalid have died a more noble death, perhaps by sacrificing his life to save Jahira? I wonder if Bioware didn't expect players to care about the characters from the first game because they were so two dimensional. I only came to care about Khalid because of a side quest in Siege of Dragonspear, which obviously wouldn't have been considered at the time. In Baldur's Gate 1, Dinah here didn't have much of a personality at all, and was likely in most parties because Mince came with her. 
While Jahira regularly bemoans the death of Kali throughout the game, Minx moves on strangely quickly. Putting these slightly abrupt starts of the story to one side, everything else about this opening level is a masterclass in teaching you what to expect from the game going forward. You start at character level 9, so the practice enemies are a much higher level than the rats you stepped on in Candlekeep, although they are just as easy given your own extra power. I took this opportunity to dual class into a fighter mage, which meant my playable character was a little too weak to start, but soon became appropriately godlike. Other CRPGs tend to focus exclusively on learning combat and the opening level, but Baldur's Gate 2 also shoves a bunch of puzzles and riddles your way because they're a huge part of the game this time around. You've barely left the first room when you have to deal with enemies that won't stop spawning until you switch off the conductor in the middle of the room. You're posed a riddle in the very next room where you're asked what you would do if you and your sibling were trapped and had a magical button to press that might kill you or your sibling or both. After that there's a bunch of locked doors that you can't get past until you find the right item to command a golem who will then open the doors for you. Or there's the magical barrier protecting an enemy that you have to switch off before you can defeat it. None of this is especially complicated but it is unusual to have so many of these little puzzles and riddles so early on. In addition to combat puzzles and riddles, the opening level even serves as an excellent introduction to the main nemesis, John Irenicus. In fact, this level does more than the entirety of Siege of Dragonspear when it comes to laying the groundwork for what will go on to be an incredibly compelling villain. This dungeon is Irenicus' home and the more you explore, the more complex he becomes. He's been growing people in vats, leaving them to go mad with the pain and they beg you to put them out of their misery. Then you stumble upon his bedroom and office. This humanises him somewhat and tells you that we're not dealing with another demigod like Saravok. Irenicus keeps three dryads captive nearby, immediately leading you to assume that they are there as concubines. However, after talking to them, it turns out he kidnapped the dryads to instill emotion in him. The dryads can't do it though because he's barren inside. Then you stumble upon another bedroom, this one beautifully laid out as a tribute to a lost love. As Imuin points out, it seems almost unbelievable that this room could belong to the same person that is growing those awful experiments in the glass containers. Exploring Irenicus' home tells us that he used to be in love, which suggests that he once had emotions but has lost them. Part of him is clearly trying to recover those lost emotions, but without a conscience to rein him in, he goes about it in a horrible way, experimenting on people and keeping women captive. Irenicus is already more complicated than Saravok and we're still in the tutorial. Sure, Saravok ended up having a connection to the protagonist, but it was a blood relationship, not a personal connection. You don't have to wait long to be introduced to the man himself. Upon escaping the dungeon, you come face to face with Irenicus, who doesn't seem at all surprised to see you've escaped. Imoin attempts to kill him, but her magic isn't effective. The cowed wizards promptly show up in response to the use of magic, which is illegal in Athkatla. This doesn't phase Irenicus much. He easily dispatches of all the wizards in a demonstration of great power, and when more show up, he casually decides to let himself be captured along with Imoen. He left in no doubt that Irenicus could have taken them all out if he wanted to, and the way he calmly surrenders only adds to his apparent power. It's also fairly obvious that he's doing the whole villain deliberately lets himself get captured thing. Imoen is taken captive as well, and you have no idea where to find her. At this point, it should be fairly clear Imoen is going to play a major part in the story. I'd somehow escaped knowing her true identity over all these years, but it turns out that Imoen is also a ballspawn. When Irenicus talks about unlocking your true power, he's talking to Imoen as much as he is you. I always assumed Imoen was just there as a convenient early companion who could easily detect traps until you replaced her, and maybe that was her role in the first game. You don't officially find out she's a ballspawn until much later, however there are plenty of early clues that make her fate obvious such as the opening movie here which specifically mentions Imoen as having a background as mysterious as yours, and the fact that she cannot be killed in the opening dungeon. If she gets dangerously low on health, she makes an excuse and leaves the dungeon without you. As prologues go, it's pretty much perfect. The combat ramps up slowly in difficulty, there are traps, puzzles and riddles, and we're introduced to a compelling antagonist. Irenicus is incredibly powerful with some kind of personal connection to you and your friends. He's clearly evil, judging by the experiments in the dungeon, but he wasn't always like this, and there are clues that imply he wants to be a better person. While the first chapter only takes a couple of hours, the second can easily take you 20 hours to complete, if not a lot more. The second chapter of Baldur's Gate 2 is an excellent example of how important pacing is in any story, be it a book, movie or game. When pacing comes up in the context of video games, it's usually because things are moving too slowly. 
This is common with open world games where story progression often comes too slowly because there's so much busy work to complete. Anthem even takes the extreme step of adding roadblocks to stop you reaching the end of the story too fast. This type of content is usually a chore to complete. Sure you might want to complete 100% of the first section of a map, but by the time you reach the end of the game those collectibles and fetch quests hold zero appeal. It's low effort content for the sake of padding game time, and it often ruins the pacing. Baldur's Gate 2 has a pacing problem, but it's nothing to do with low quality content. I want to make it absolutely clear that most of the missions in Chapter 2 are really good. This isn't a case of unnecessary padding. It's a problem of there being too many good quests all crammed into an early section of the game. It's not a great sign when you're told that to reach your goal of rescuing Imoin you need to complete a bunch of random quests to earn 20,000 gold, which you then use to pay the shadow thieves for info on Imoin's whereabouts. I suspect this section is Bioware's attempt at recreating the feeling of being an adventurer that I enjoyed so much in the original. All that wandering the forests, completing small quests, picking up rumours about an iron shortage and then retiring to an inn to rest for the evening was probably the strongest part of the game. You truly felt like the group of adventurers that everyone referred to you as. Your adventure led you to the grand city of Baldur's Gate which you approached with a long and slightly nervy walk across the bridge. It was a memorable moment in a game full of firsts. Baldur's Gate 2 doesn't quite recapture that magic. You're not a low level adventurer anymore. Instead of working your way up to a big city, you start in one and only need to venture outside the city when given specific missions to complete. This is all completely fitting with both the story and your overall progression from those early days in Candlekeep, but it does mean that overall exploration is less satisfying and just dumping a load of quests on the player and expecting them to stay engaged is difficult to manage. Not much changes during Chapter 2. You start off needing money to find Imoin and you end it still needing to track down Imoin. You build closer relationships with companions and uncover a conflict between the Shadow Thieves and the Vampires, but nothing in the main story changes. This wouldn't be a huge problem if it weren't for the length of the chapter and here I'm a bit conflicted. You see, Chapter 2 doesn't need to take anywhere near 20 hours to complete. The citizens of Athkatla aren't short of a few bob, so it's easy to earn that amount of money and progress the story if you so choose. Raising 20,000 gold is nowhere near as difficult as it was in the previous game, and at least one quest pays an entire 10,000 gold. You aren't reuniting children with their lost pets anymore, you're doing chores for the 1%. So if all the quests are optional, why is there a pacing problem? You can easily skip a bunch of quests by roleplaying as someone desperate to rescue her friend and find out what Irenicus wants with her. That's easier said than done though. Even with pointless content such as the box ticking exercises in Ubisoft games, I find it hard to ignore all the things to do, and here those things are actually compelling. Many of the quests felt urgent, and I got the distinct impression that after rescuing Imoin I would be forced into doing more important missions that put this stuff to the side. I was partially correct. After rescuing Imoin you end up on a linear path for quite a while and don't return to these quests until near the end of the game at which point the story disconnect is only going to be more apparent. So no, you don't have to spend a ridiculous amount of time in Chapter 2, however you likely will the first time around. Due to the high quality of quests, I can't say that this section was rushed or anything like that, it's just not particularly well implemented. Ray Muzika recognised that Chapter 2 was far too long, stating that players could spend 60 hours doing side quests, which led to the early game being bloated. Bioware never figured out how to fix this problem and just did its best to work around it. The problem likely comes about as a result of those early design decisions where Bioware decided it wanted to include companion missions and the opportunity to own your own fortress of sorts, but it didn't know where to put those quests. Optional missions like this don't fit into later parts of the story which take place in other locations, so the only chapter they can go in is Chapter 2 with the option to return to them close to the end. Bioware promised that Baldur's Gate 2 wouldn't rely on fetch quests and it largely delivered. There's still a lot more moving back and forth between buildings than I would like, but the quests are more interesting than those in the first game. I also love how organically quests can start and even introduce new companions. One of the most memorable quests is the Cult of the Eyeless. It starts with you bumping into a priest in the Temple District who asks you to investigate a cult in the sewers, which then serves as an introduction to Keldon who's down there fighting the undead. Getting information on the Cult of the Eyeless requires you to join up with them, which in turn requires you to, yep, you guessed it, lose your eyes. If you survive the procedure, you're deemed fit to join the Cult. 
We'd rather not do that of course, so fortunately there's another way in which requires retrieving two halves of a rod which we can then use to descend the pit of the Faithless and eventually destroy the cult's god. It's a massive quest, taking you to a bunch of new maps and introducing a companion you could easily miss. One quest asks you to find out who killed a couple of cowed wizards. It leads you to a distant area of the world map where you find Valagar. If you talk to him you find out that he acted in self-defence. In a lesser game the quest would have ended with you going back to the cowed wizards to convince them it was an accident. Instead you can have Valagar join your team and enter the strange spear in Athkatla, move between planes and eventually have your own mage fortress. Then there are random quests that start with you sneaking through a secret door in the back of a pub and eventually breaking up a slave ring, or helping companions liberate their family castle which is a multi-flawed area that could easily be a mandatory dungeon. Even the quests that look simple at first glance can take you all over the place. For example there's a serial killer on the loose in Athkatla so I decided to hunt him or her down. That required a bunch of questioning and looking for clues and then when you do find him he turns out to be working for someone else on the opposite end of the world map. You go over there to track the boss down, which in turn requires information from a merchant who will only talk if you identify yourself by purchasing a specific book, and then figuring out a puzzle to give a code name. There are some simple quests, but you'll never know which ones until you finish them. I did as many quests as I could manage, but I dread to think how many adventures I missed out on. I know the vampire storyline has some major content because I found a random book talking about a cure for vampirism, but when I visited the appropriate temple there was nothing I could do. Presumably you have to side with the vampires instead of the shadow thieves to see this content. Once you set out to rescue Imowin, you don't return to the main map for quite some time, probably another 10 to 20 hours, and therefore the potential companions have to be introduced in chapter 2, further adding more quests to an already crowded chapter. It makes sense. It wouldn't be fair to introduce a new companion halfway through because players with a full squad would have to leave the team member somewhere. Usually abandoned teammates go to an inn or where you met them in the first place, however if you're trapped on an island and can't escape, which is effectively what happens here, the companion can hardly go and wait for you back in the starter town, and if they did you wouldn't be able to reunite for ages. Not only do most of the 20 or so companions need to be introduced early on, they also need to have their loyalty missions here as well, if they have one. It takes a heart of stone to ignore all their pleading to help on their personal quests so you'll likely do at least 5 lengthy missions just to keep companions happy. I strongly recommend you do these companion quests. You're going to spend around 80 hours with these people, you might as well learn a bit about them. Some characters clearly have a bit more thought put into them than others though. Jahira's quest is especially strong and is the exception to the rule in that it continues well into the game, such that you're still dealing with the consequences late on. Before playing Baldur's Gate 2 I'd spent a lot of time with Jahira throughout Baldur's Gate 1 and Siege of Dragonspear, but I didn't know much about her other than that she loved Khalid and the two of them made a promise to Gorion to look after you if you came seeking help. Siege of Dragonspear included a brief mention of her past, a hint about what is to come in Baldur's Gate 2, but it's more of an easter egg for existing fans and anything that captures the imagination of a new player. Jahira is a member of a group called the Harpers who claim to maintain balance between all the various factions in Athkatla. The Harpers summon Jahira to their base, where you're questioned by a Harper known as Galvary who is clearly looking to stitch you up. You end up killing him and assassins pop up during your travels to try and kill you and Jahira. One night you'll go to sleep and Jahira will just disappear. A mage called Terminsel drops off a note letting you know that she's returned to the Harpers. Faced with a choice, Jahira rejects the Harpers and sticks with you on the mission. Terminsel is an anagram of Elminster by the way, he's the sage old wizard who pops up fairly often. You can romance Jahira if you like, but only if you play as a male and as specific races. Romance options are fairly limited overall, which feels odd when compared to modern Bioware games. I didn't develop any relationships during my playthrough, and that's hardly a surprise when, according to wikis, the only romance option available for a female character is Animan. Animan was in my party, but when it came to dating him, well, imagine if you played Mass Effect as Femshep, and the only romance option available was an even more insecure version of Caden. At least Femshep probably had a bunch of high tech sex toys to keep her amused. I feel genuinely bad for my protagonist here. This is all worlds away from modern Bioware games like Mass Effect and Dragon Age where many of your companions are open to relationships with both genders and aren't too picky if you don't look at all like them, or even if you come from the same planet. The obvious advantage of this system is that it lets players act out a broader array of fantasies, which in turn means greater role playing potential. In Baldur's Gate 2 you can cast as wide a net as you like in terms of who you're prepared to date, 
but that doesn't mean everyone else is quite so accepting. Most characters are straight for a start and quite a few are picky on which races they will date, with races in this case referring to status such as human, elf, halfling, orc, etc, not skin colour. I'm not familiar enough with the Forgotten Realms universe to know how much to read into this. Given common fantasy tropes regarding relations between elves and dwarves, I doubt I would have given this a second thought if it wasn't for more modern Bioware games breaking down most of the physical barriers. And this doesn't even account for the companions who simply aren't interested in relationships with any character, perhaps because they're too old or simply already in a relationship with another NPC. Keldon is a good example. He's married when you meet him, although his wife recently had an affair because of how much time he spent away from home. You can help him repair the relationship so he leaves on happy terms, promising to return to his wife as soon as this final mission is complete. He's lying though. If you remove him from your party at any point he goes straight back to the order and waits for you there. With 20 or so characters and all these restrictions you can imagine how hard it is to find that special someone. I played as a bisexual female human and still couldn't find a mate if you don't count animate and I definitely don't, so you can imagine how tough it would have been for a gay orc to find love. This isn't an approach you see in many modern games, it's seen as exclusionary. As a general rule of thumb that I've thought about for as roughly as long as it takes to type this sentence, the more freedom you have in creating your character, the more freedom you have in who you romance, assuming that's an option at all in the game. In The Witcher 3, Geralt, a character you have little flexibility with, is given possibly the toughest choice ever presented in any form of media when he must choose between Triss and Yen. Contrast that to games with freeform character creation kits like Skyrim and Divinity Original Sin, where I'm not aware of any romance limitations based on your race. On balance I probably prefer being able to cast a wide net, but I didn't hate the lack of choice on offer in Baldur's Gate 2, specifically because dating shouldn't be a one-sided choice. It's been a while since I played Dragon Age, but if I recall correctly you choose who you want to date, and then woo them by saying what they want to hear and buying them presents. Romancing a companion rarely feels like a clash of personalities where a successful match comes down to luck. It's rather a simple puzzle there to be solved once you've made your decision. Perhaps ending up in a romantic relationship should feel more chaotic and random, and not like a choice one party makes and the other goes along with. It's easy for me to say this of course, I'm a straight white male and I don't have to look far for those relationships to be represented elsewhere. The reason Geralt's choice was so damn difficult for me was likely because it was easy for me to imagine myself as Geralt, faced with the choice of those two incredible women. Other people might look to games for romantic escapism they don't get elsewhere, and in that situation coming face to face with strict race and gender limitations in Baldur's Gate 2 may be a little too close to home. Obviously I can't speak for those people nor would I want to suggest they all have one generic opinion anyway, but it's something to consider. Variety is the spice of life, but ending my journey without a romantic partner didn't spoil the experience in the slightest. And let's face it, we could all learn to do better when accepting rejection. Whatever you personally prefer, the modern trend is clearly towards more freedom of choice, and that's evident in the new companions Beamdog introduced for the Enhanced Edition. None of the new companions have any race restrictions. Nira and Rasad are both straight, dating exclusively men and women respectively. Hexa is a gay female and Dawn will romance absolutely anyone, so at least there's someone out there for the gay half-orc. There's a lot of companion banter this time around, although it tends to pop up at the worst possible moments. These constant interruptions are something you have to get used to, especially in Chapter 2. There are so many quests you can barely move without being stopped and asked to help defend someone innocent against an assassin, or go look for a missing friend or solve a murder. The biggest challenge in the first 20 to 30 hours of Baldur's Gate 2 is completing any one quest, because you're constantly given new ones and the quest you were working on might take you to somewhere else, where you're given a bunch of new quests and before you know it you've lost track of what on earth you were trying to do. For example I was in the Temple District and made what seemed like an innocent enough decision to pop back to the Bridge District for more supplies. On my way out of the Temple District I had to stop and watch an argument between priests, which led to the Cult of the Eyeless quest I mentioned earlier. I wasn't ready to do that quest yet, so I carried on to the bridge district. On arriving I was immediately stopped by a guard who gave me a token warning about not causing any trouble. A few steps later I ran into some peasants who had just found the dead bodies of some thieves. This was just here as a bit of world building for the conflict between the shadow thieves and the vampires. I was allowed into the inn where I restocked and took a nap. On leaving I was immediately interrupted by a citizen pleading for help which led to an ambush from vampires. After defeating them I made my way towards the exit of the bridge district where a cutscene kicked in and I got reintroduced to Nera, who had just been in a scrap of her own. 
After this, I barely had time to move before being attacked by a mugger. I was now allowed to leave the district and head to a new one except this led me to yet another encounter with Mira, who this time asks to join my group and wants me to meet her for a companion quest. It took me 10 minutes to walk a couple of short steps and rest for the night, it should have taken around 2. This level of interruption obviously isn't consistent throughout the entire game but you never go far without something popping up, especially while in the city. Take that situation with Jahira when she leaves your group. In my case I'd just travelled to the furthest destination from the Harper base on the entire map. I didn't have to go and get her immediately but without her I was down a companion and she had loads of gear on her that I didn't want to go without. I proceeded to travel right back to the city which I'd just left, via a couple of random encounters of course, because I had to complete Jahira's story on the game's time, just so I could get back on with what I was doing before. With all these interruptions I didn't bother chopping and changing companions to see all the optional quests on offer. Both Baldur's Gate 1 and Siege of Dragonspear gave you a lot of choice regarding team composition, however the depth of these companions was never enough to make you want to replay the game just to experiment with a different lineup. There is a clear distinction between a good and evil party as reflected throughout the choices your character makes in dialogue, but from my limited experience with evil party members in those two games, the mere act of having them in the party isn't overly interesting. That completely changes in Baldur's Gate 2. I'd love to do another playthrough with a completely different team. Given all the added conversations and companion questlines, I'm sure having characters like Dawn and Edwin in my team would make a huge difference to the experience. In this playthrough, I killed Dawn and Edwin just for the hell of it, and even killed a good companion called Aerie completely by accident. In fact, if I hadn't gone to a wiki to grab the spellings for a couple of the character names, I wouldn't have even known Aerie was a possible companion. There's an early mission close to that first meeting with Arenicus where you enter a circus tent under the control of Kala. An orc asks you to give him a weapon but I was reluctant, it felt like a trap so I declined. The orc attacked instantly and died within seconds. I carried on with the quest and thought nothing more of it. Well, that orc was airy under one of Kalar's illusions and she could have been a companion for the entire game. She had plenty of dialogue and even has her own questline and yet Bioware had the confidence to let me kill her and move on without even making it clear that she could be a companion. Now compare that to Beamdog editions like Dawn. I killed Dawn in Baldur's Gate 1, but I guess he came back to life, like stranger things have happened in this world. You might expect Dawn to be seeking revenge and either attack on sight or taunt you a little first and then try to kill you. That's probably what would have happened if Dawn had been a creation of Bioware, but Beamdog doesn't want you to miss out on its new content. Screw role playing and consistency, they wrote stuff and you're damn sure gonna read it. Bioware had the confidence to let you miss huge chunks of content, Beamdog doesn't want you to miss a word. Missing out on a companion questline is nothing compared to what comes later, but first we need to rescue Imoim. If you don't want to pay the Shadow Thieves all that gold, you can instead choose to side with the mysterious Bodhi of the Vampire faction. I chose the Shadow Thieves and was promptly betrayed by Saemon Haverian, the captain of the ship that took me to Spellhold, where Imoim and Irenicus are being held. After all those hours spent doing nothing but side quests, we get a bunch of story reveals dumped on us in quick succession. Irenicus has taken over the Spellhold and imprisoned the cowed wizards who first brought him there. Not only did Irenicus want to come here all along, he also wanted Imoen and yourself there as well. It's one of those slightly cliche, I made it hard for you to get here so you wouldn't be suspicious, but not so hard you wouldn't make it here kind of things. Irenicus wants Imoen because she is also a Balspawn. He steals part of her soul and gives it to Bodhi who is referred to as his sister but I think they're just close friends. One of the reasons I want to play Baldur's Gate 2 again is to see how this plays out if you chose to side with Bodhi and the vampires early on. Irenicus then takes part of your soul for himself and gives Bodhi the order to finish you off. Imowin can now rejoin your group. I mentioned earlier how Bioware had to introduce all the companions early because of how linear the game gets after chapter 2. What are you going to do with the companion you reject in favour of Imowin? Well that problem sorts itself out through a carefully structured betrayal. Yoshimo, one of the companions you've had since the beginning, is a traitor. He's been working for Arenicus all along, although it's not entirely clear why. Initially he worked for Arenicus voluntarily, however Arenicus also kept him in line with spells that became impossible to ignore. You have no choice but to kill Yoshimo. However, if you sympathise with him at all, you can keep his heart and take it to a temple of Ilmata, where a priest will bless it and ensure that Yoshimo is able to reach the afterlife. I found this out by accident. I only kept his heart after the battle because it stood out as unusual that I was given the option to. Just before you kill him he does say he hopes his heart can find peace with Ilmata, but I didn't realise he was talking so literally. 
I would have liked to get more information from Yoshimo and maybe even have the choice to forgive him without killing him, but being able to help him after death is a good alternative. Yoshimo was a bounty hunter and essentially the thief of the party which means that Imoen fits in nicely as a replacement. There's no way this was an accident and with hindsight I should have seen it coming a mile off. With Imoen back in the party we face off against Bodhi, however during the fight something happens to our protagonist. Anger overwhelms her and she transforms into the Slayer, one of the avatars of Baal, a beast who attacks both friend and foe. The missing part of your soul is filled with murderous rage and unless you get your soul back the taint of Baal will consume you completely. Bioware wanted to give players a choice of good and evil roots, and the player's transformation into the Slayer is a part of that. From this point on you can choose to become the Slayer at any time, although you still won't have control of your actions which means you may end up doing more harm than good. Crucially you also lose one point of party reputation every time you give in to the anger, so it's only really for evil parties or those who want to spend a lot of time and money donating to temples. At one point you get trapped in the Mind Flayer's dungeon and I had to become the Slayer a couple of times to break down doors. If there was another way to get through the doors then I don't know how. It felt unfair to lose reputation for this especially because no one would have known about it anyway. But other than that, the Slayer avatar is a great way to truly show your evil side beyond just being rude to people you meet. After Bodhi and Arenicus have fled, you're left to find your way out of Spellhold, which you can do either via the portal that Arenicus took, or by getting back on the ship helmed by Haverian who betrayed you earlier. The captain doesn't actually have a ship of his own anymore, so you have to steal one for him only to get attacked en route and end up shipwrecked at Sahorgan City. So Horgan City doesn't add much to the overall story and your major task here is to sort out a civil war. However it's worth the visit because there's a cool puzzle that has you matching special items up with the character who wants them and a friendly beholder called Spectator who is guarding a chest. Despite appearances he's a fair guy to deal with and if you let him live he pops up again in Throne of Baal to help you in one of the big fights. I'm all for Spectator getting his own spin-off game one day, although it should be noted that many players will never have met him. If you take the portal from Spellhold instead of Harvarian's ship, you go straight to the next area, the Underdark. This explains why no one on the island mentions Arenicus having come through here. That means this entire map is completely skippable. There's no way to get back to it later either, so that's it. You'll just have to do a second playthrough if you want to see it. Imagine Beamdog making a choice like this. When you do eventually end up in the Underdark, you meet a dragon who promises to get you to the exit so long as you retrieve her eggs from the nearby drow city of Usnatha. The drow city is matriarchal so the women are in charge although nothing especially interesting is done with this. It's a society of dark elves that just so happens to have women in charge instead of men. Given that you can hardly make out genders from the small images and random names anyway it doesn't mean an awful lot. I enjoyed my time in Usnatha because it gave me a chance to be evil for a bit. The drow are as bad as each other so I didn't feel bad about stepping outside of my usual boundaries even if it meant taking orders from a fish in a tube. It's all a little forced mind you. If you go outside the narrow rules of what you're allowed to do an alarm sounds and the entire city turns against you. You're still given a little bit of freedom when it comes to stealing the eggs and betraying the leader of the drow, but mainly you're just rushed to complete a bunch of tasks. Many of the quests here fell a little flat because I'd accidentally completed them already after getting lost in the Underdark. The dark maps can be a nightmare to navigate and I couldn't for the life of me find my way up to the drow city. I went everywhere else it was possible to go, which meant I already had many of the items I would later be sent to fetch. By this point I was desperate to get back to the mainland. I've rushed through it a bit, but you spend a long time away from the main map. There are a bunch of quests at Brynlaw before you reach Spellhold, then there's Spellhold itself before, in my case at least, I ended up shipwrecked in Sahorgan City. We then spend hours underground and in the Drow City. It's probably another 20 hours where you can't do much in the way of exploration. Instead you just push through small maps and complete the quests you're given. This level of linearity is common near the end of a lengthy RPG but less so in the middle where you usually have a significant amount of freedom. As you move into chapter 6 the narrator describes the protagonist's joy at leaving behind the regions of darkness filled with constant treachery and moving into the light and I felt much the same. It was great to be above ground and on familiar territory again. We now meet the elves who gradually reveal their complex history with Arenicus. Both Arenicus and Bodhi used to be elves. Arenicus in particular reached a high status, gaining the love of the elven queen Alessimi. It was a recreation of her bedroom we saw right back at the beginning of the game. Hooking up with the queen wasn't enough for John. Along with Bodhi he sought power and eventually went after godhood. They failed and both were banished for their crimes, no longer able to call themselves elves. 
Despite this, Arenicus continues his efforts to become a god and intends to reclaim what he lost when the elves banished him. For this he needs a soul, hence he steals part of yours, with Imowen's soul going to Bodhi. Before dealing with Arenicus, you need to kill Bodhi, but you needn't take on the task alone. Groups like the Shadow Thieves and the Order of the Radiant Heart will help if you've completed their side stories. This is where you finally get the chance to complete all those quests you got early on if you didn't do them all during Chapter 2. Having people with you to help against Bodhi doesn't make a lot of difference, or at least it didn't for me, but I appreciated the attempt to justify what otherwise would have been wasting time with little excuse. It's not the last time Bioware essentially tells you to go out and make friends with the justification that it will help in the final battle. After defeating Bodhi, it's on to the big fight against Arenicus who has taken over the Tree of Life which he plans to drain of all energy in his attempt to become a god. The initial fight against Arenicus is disappointing, taking place in the tree on a tiny platform with little opportunity to place your team in tactically advantageous positions. Fortunately it's also fairly easy, with a few breach magic spells enough to send you both to hell where you must face your inner self and see if you're worthy of regaining your soul. While a little cheesy, I do like how most of this plays out. You meet a version of Saravok who promises to teach you how to use your wrath and become the weapon of murder you were always meant to be. Your greed offers you a powerful weapon which you can only keep if you kill its owner. The test of selfishness tasks you with either letting one of your companions die or taking a personal hit to your attributes. It's not much of a choice and doesn't really test your selfishness at all. I lost a couple of hit points and a dexterity point. That's much better than losing a companion. After all, even from a selfish point of view, I'd rather have my companion there to deal extra damage and soak up attacks that would otherwise hit me, and it's too late to back out and get a replacement companion at this point. A better option would be to have a companion get a similar level of punishment as you, or even perhaps less. That would truly test how much you wanted to sacrifice for your friends. The fear challenge is also a bit naff, so long as you buff up on resist fear spells you should be fine. Finally there's pride. A monster tries to enhance your ego before setting you the task of killing a dragon. If you can swallow your pride, the dragon will just give you what you need without having to fight. Once you've done all that, you can fight John Arenicus for possession of your soul. It's a tough fight as far as the base game content goes, but it's otherwise unremarkable. John Arenicus is a great villain who we've gotten to know gradually over the course of the game through meetings and dreams, not to mention appearances in Siege of Dragonspear. We learned a little about his life before he became the villain he is now and have a personal reason for wanting to destroy him, beyond his status as a threat to the world. He used to love Alyssamy and a part of him still does if the immaculate bedroom for his lost love is anything to go by. Arenicus is still a little two dimensional at times, but it's in that beautifully deliberate and knowing way, perfectly captured by David Warner who portrays him as equal parts arrogant, brilliant and crazy. The sort of villain who would be perfect for a comic book movie that doesn't take itself too seriously. What is this? You have released all of my test subjects? How wonderfully mad of you. I did not expect this in the least, so dangerously risky it is. Unfortunately, everything that makes Arenicus a compelling villain also serves to reduce the impact of this final boss battle. We know him. He's been humanised somewhat, and we've met him multiple times already. As far as fights play out, he's just another powerful mage who summons minions to help him fight. He might have great stats, but all that does is influence a bunch of dice rolls that you don't even see. While I found the fight tough, it played out in the same way as many other battles against powerful mages, and was relatively unexciting as a result. Compare that to the fight against Saravok. While he was a boring villain, he did at least make an impression in that final battle where you saw him for only the second time. Don't get me wrong, I'll take an interesting villain over a spectacle battle any day, but it did mean that final fight felt a little anticlimactic, as does the conclusion. Alyssamy throws a party for you when you return and you watch a quick cutscene as Arenicus burns in the fires of hell. The screen barely has time to fade to black when you're thrown into the opening scene of Throne of Baal, further contributing to the underwhelming feeling of defeating Arenicus, who is otherwise a great antagonist. As with the expansion for the original Baldur's Gate, Throne of Baal is split into two main parts, a puzzle dungeon and a story. The puzzle dungeon Watcher's Keep doesn't reach the highs of the excellent Durlag's Tower, however Throne of Baal's story far exceeds the dull side quest that was the focus in Tales of the Sword Coast. Throne of Baal also goes heavy on the jokes, which is refreshing given that by the time you get to this, you're starting to get a bit exhausted. There's the absolutely adorable Cespinar who can make you quality gear if you find all the right components, and we finally do something with the golden pantaloons that we first found at the Friendly Arm Inn at the beginning of the adventure. Now, I must admit I dumped them somewhere and forgot about them, so I had to use the cheat engine to summon a new pet. 
When combined with a couple of other items of clothing you can make a silly weapon and a massive suit of armour, which is unfortunately so big that you can't fit through most of the doors with it, so I had to take it off. The base game wasn't short on humour either, but Throne of Baal really runs with it. My favourite joke is the group of adventurers you meet who challenge you to a fight only to reload from their last save point when your victory looks inevitable. Given how often I'd done the same thing it felt especially fitting. You can actually enter Watcher's Keep at any time. I didn't even realise it was part of the expansion at first. I wandered over there almost immediately and hit a huge and almost insurmountable difficulty spike. I didn't get very far but it was a fruitful diversion nonetheless. For some bizarre reason a vendor just outside Watcher's Keep is the only place in the base game to acquire a potion bag that I can't imagine playing without. There's also some great loot on the first floor like the bags of infinite arrows and bolts which will save you messing around with ammo for a while and the case of plenty that provides much needed extra storage. If you ever play Baldur's Gate 2 yourself I highly recommend you make the same mistake I did by going to Watcher's Keep early and grabbing whatever loot you can from the first floor. I've made many mistakes while playing this series however this one was by far the most fruitful. In terms of puzzles Watcher's Keep is far simpler than Durlag's Tower and it's missing the heartfelt story that unraveled the deeper you ventured. Fortunately it's still entertaining with a decent mix of humour thrown in as well, such as when you awaken an angry ghost only for him to calm down instantly when he sees you've brought him his golden slippers. Whereas Durlag's Tower had the confidence to let the player figure most things out for themselves, or at least try to keep the clues cryptic, Watcher's Keep has a tendency to spell the solution out for you via a series of notes left around each floor. I suspect these were a late or uncertain addition because there's typically enough environmental context for you to figure it out by yourself. I rarely felt like I solved any puzzles, I simply moved through them, like completing a crossword puzzle while using Google to find all the answers. The second floor is a great example. You need to collect four keys, one from each of the circular rooms in the corners. The rooms each belong to a wizard who was carefully devising a way to kill another one of the wizards, hence the rooms can be used against each other somewhat. Each room has an elemental theme, lightning, poison, ice and fire. The lightning room is simple enough to deal with, you just turn off the conductor. The poison room is a little trickier, you have to open the connecting doors and then turn on the large fan in the lightning room, which will blow the poison out of the poison room and allow you to collect the key. You can then open another door to send the poison to the ice room which weakens the monsters in there. Finally the beasts from the fire room need to be lured to the ice room to freeze them, and all of the minions need to be killed before you can tackle the main beast. You don't need to work any of this out yourself though. The wizards all left behind notes telling you how they were planning on killing someone else, so you just use these notes to get the key from each room. I suppose without the clues there could be room for confusion. Perhaps players might try to use the fan to blow out the fire or try to lure the ice beasts into the fire room to melt them, or perhaps not realise that poison defeats ice. Except it's almost impossible to go wrong anyway because the doors unlock in sequential order. You can't send the wind to the fire room because the door is locked and you can't lure the ice beasts to the fire room for the same reason. There's a good chance you'll send poison into the ice room without thinking about it because that's the next door to open anyway, and you've already got the fan on. It's obvious you have to defeat the minions in the fire room before taking on the boss because there's a clear link between the boss and the fire. What should have been a satisfying puzzle became strictly a moderately difficult combat challenge. Durlag's tower had traps all over the place but that was fitting given the story of the tower itself. Watcher's Keep also has a bunch of traps, but they don't make any sense. Why do all the small libraries on this floor have traps scattered all over the place? The traps are here because Durlag's Tower had traps and therefore Watcher's Keep must have them as well. A similar situation pops up on the third floor which is a maze of portals for you to navigate. A madman's diary gives you clues to the way out, but there's little faith placed on the player to figure anything out. One clue tells you to turn west once you reach a certain pillar, and then the rest of it basically spells it all out. The puzzles on the fourth floor require you to light torches in an order that is clearly marked out on the floor, and use a hammer to tap on a piece of glass as many times as you're told in a note. The instructions to use the machine and leave the level are ever so slightly more complex, but barely. This floor has mimic chests on it though, so that earns it a point. The puzzles and riddles in the main game aren't any more challenging than those of Watcher's Keep, and if every major dungeon area had puzzles like the ones here I'd actually be praising it, like I did earlier. For general dungeoneering, soft puzzles like this are perfect, they keep you engaged but don't block your progress. However, for an area that is designed specifically as a puzzle dungeon, I want my progress to be blocked occasionally. I want to get stumped and have to think things through. There's no better example of a puzzle that has you moving through the motions as the one on level 5, 
where you select which direction your character moves until you reach an exit. Another test requires you to show your courage by defeating a dragon. This feels similar to the end of the base game where our pride inflated our ego to encourage us to kill a dragon, but if we wanted to we could just talk to the dragon instead. This time you just have to kill the dragon. No choice, just get on with it. And then there's the last puzzle. For me at least, this was the final puzzle before defeating the big boss. What sort of epic challenge would await me? I hope you've all taken your clever pills because this is a tricky one to follow. You have to put an object in each of four coloured tubes, but there's no way to know which object goes in which tube, except there is, you just match up the colour, that's literally it. The explanation tries to make it sound like this is going to be a huge challenge. You're told that every time you press the button there's no telling what you'll get and every time you press it you'll have to defeat some enemies. It's supposed to sound random but you just press it four times to get the four objects and you're done. The final boss of Watcher's Keep reveals that you've been betrayed. You were sent in here to do someone else's dirty work. If you like you can leave the boss unharmed and send brother Pole in to die. You still don't want the boss getting out so you can collapse the keep and kill them both if you want. Nothing about the story here was particularly engaging so I didn't really care. The rest of the expansion more than makes up for it. Throne of Baal pits you against the Five, a mysterious group who think you've become too powerful and need to be taken out of the picture. The story would have been excellent if spread out over an entire game. You spend time in two different realms. The Pocket Plane is a realm created by Baal where you must face five challenges throughout your journey, while in Tathir you must defeat the Five and either become the God of Murder or live a normal mortal life. The Pocket Plane would have been a lot more interesting if it weren't so similar to the trials we completed in Hell just an hour or so ago. You alternate between the Pocket Plane and the real world, facing a challenge each time you return to the Pocket Plane. These challenges include things like facing your own lingering doubt, other Baal spawn and an alternative version of yourself, one that didn't benefit from Gorion's teachings. The last one feels especially redundant having already featured similarly in Baldur's Gate 1. You also meet Saravok in the Pocket Plane and he can even join your team. This is a less powerful Saravok mind you, so it's not going to be all conquering. Oh and for maximum cliche points we're asked to consider if maybe we're as bad as the other Baal spawn because of all the people we've killed. There are Baal spawn everywhere now by the way, not all of them are threatening, many just want to get on with their lives. In Tathir things move quickly and become less satisfying the more you play. I don't often complain about a story not being more stretched out, but this one definitely should have been. Things start well. There's a bunch of side quests in the opening city and you're tasked with hunting down Yaga Shura of the Five. He's invincible so to free him you need to find two hearts, one being his and one belonging to the woman who raised him. My first clue that Throne of Baal might be a touch rushed is that both of these hearts were in the same location and really close by. I suspect one of them was going to be in a different place but it was cut for time, otherwise what's the point in making us get two? You can tackle a Bazigal and Sendai in any order, but both missions are challenges of endurance more than anything else, reminding me of Icewind Dale and the way they just throw enemies at you. These two Baal spawn missions were nowhere near as detailed as Yagashura, again implying that perhaps content was cut here. Worst of all is Ilicera, who I didn't even realise was part of the five until I went back re-recording the footage. She gave a nice little speech and then died in a couple of seconds, putting up no fight whatsoever. Again, given that all other members of the Five have quests attached, I can't help but think this was shoved in late as Bioware was perhaps running out of time. Plus, even though Ilicera was the first one you killed, Yagashura is referred to as the first after you defeat him. I'm pretty sure whatever happened here it changed late in the day. When you have an open-ended goal like destroy five people, the least interesting way to handle it is to have you kill one after the other, which is largely what you do here. It would have been fun to choose which order we do all five. You could then have special weapons to win from one boss that can be used against another boss, or get keys from one area that open locks on the way to bosses in other areas for special loot. The final member of the five is Balthazar, although ultimately they were all being tricked by Amelizan as were you. Amelizan was pretending to help you and the other Balspawn against the five. She gathered Balspawn together in Saradash on the pretense of keeping everyone safe, but actually just wanted you all together to make you easier to kill. This reveal would have had more impact if the story had been spread out over a full game. As it stands the final fight was just a long and exhausting slog against someone I didn't even really care about. On defeating Amalasan you make the big choice, will you become the Lord of Murder? Bioware stated that they wanted there to be good and evil choices throughout and I assumed elevating yourself to become the Lord of Murder would be considered somewhere on the evil side of the alignment spectrum. It's not and the endings are largely the same with just some different words at the bottom of the screen. As Lord of Murder you're part of the balance between good and evil, not necessarily evil itself. It's an epic ending for an epic story. 
Over 150 hours ago I was exploring Candlekeep listening to old men explain what red and green circles under people's feet represented and dealing with those pesky rats in a basement. I watched a Gorion get killed in front of me, formed a group of adventurers, investigated an iron crisis and eventually killed the man responsible for Gorion's murder after uncovering a conspiracy that led all the way back to Candlekeep. Siege of Dragonsfield is a lengthy diversion that didn't serve much purpose and then we wake up in a prison run by John Arenicus, have a piece of our soul stolen, transform into the Slayer, survive a shipwreck, eventually make it back to land, defeat Arenicus twice, kill every member of the Five together with their leader and potentially ascend to the position of Lord of Murder. Short summaries like that one make the whole thing sound like a trite chosen one narrative. Young boy or girl in a small town is destined to destroy evil etc etc. I'm not a fan of those stories and have been critical of later Bioware games for relying far too heavily on what has long been a worn out trope. I'm more lenient with the story of Baldur's Gate because while we did come from small beginnings and achieve great things, we weren't forced to listen to people tell us exactly what we were destined to achieve the entire time. The protagonist doesn't become the Lord of Murder because she was destined to. There are a lot of Balespawn out there, any of them could have done the same thing. The Slayer wasn't inside me all along. It came about because Arenicus stole a large part of my soul, which left a void to be filled by Baal's malice. The Five didn't target me because some old legend said I was destined to defeat them. They targeted me because I killed Arenicus and looked like a threat. In Throne of Baal there is a bunch of talk about prophecy and accepting destiny, however I'm much more accepting of that when it's near the end of the story instead of being there from the very start. I ended up becoming the Lord of Murder or accepting my own mortality because of my actions over 150 hours and if I'm allowed to get a little cheesy because of the support of my friends. You can play Baldur's Gate solo of course but I wouldn't have gotten far by myself and I like to imagine the same is true of the protagonist. She needs loyal friends around her, that's what separates her from the other bowl spawn, not a lightning bolt on the forehead. Even though a couple of my companions were a bit of a bore, there were still a lot of laughs on the journey and the increased amount of companion banter, such as Imuin teasing Anamon about the rude book that his order dropped off at the Candlekeep library, really helps you feel like part of a team that slowly bonds together over time. There's easily enough story in Throne of Baal to be stretched out over a full game and it's not hard to see how those rumours started about it originally being planned as the third game in the series. The story builds up to an epic conclusion that would easily be enough to end a grand trilogy on a high note. From my research though that doesn't appear to be the case. There's a lack of any evidence to back it up and those that do claim Throne of Baal was going to originally be a fully fledged sequel rely on the fact that there is a big story in the expansion and there were rumours that Bioware was about to lose the licence to the second edition D&D rule set. That last point is likely why the expansion was rushed but it doesn't back up claims that Throne of Baal would have been a separate game. Bioware only lost the license to the second edition rules because Wizards of the Coast wanted to push the third edition, which Bioware would have been able to license. The strongest evidence to refute the Throne of Baal theory is that a third Baldur's Gate game was in production at the same time. Baldur's Gate 3, The Black Hound, would have been a 3D game under the third edition D&D rule set, so similar to Neverwinter Nights. With Bioware busy on Neverwinter Nights, the Black Hound was developed by Black Isle and would have been the start of a new trilogy unconnected to the Baalspawn saga. The Black Hound was developed on the Jefferson engine, which Fallout fans may have heard of because it was also used for the cancelled Van Buren game. In fact, the Jefferson engine, based on Bioware's Aurora engine, never got used in a published game after these two notable failures. The Black Hound was supposedly around 80% complete when Interplay did actually lose the D&D license completely. Francis Urquhart and Chris Avalone were going to take another stab at a third Baldur's Gate game a few years later. It would have focused heavily on relationships and would take place over multiple worlds instead of one large one. Perhaps a little like Dragon Age Inquisition. It doesn't sound like this project made it too far and was cancelled when Atari Europe, who held the license at this point, was sold to Namco Bandai. In the last couple of years there's been fresh speculation about a third game, this time by Beamdog, makers of these enhanced editions. With all due respect to the parties involved, I hope a third game never happens. Baldur's Gate is the story of the Balspawn. I know it's also a city in the Forgotten Realms world, but that city doesn't play a role in the second game at all. If you want to set another game in the same location, you could call it anything else. You don't need the Baldur's Gate title beyond name recognition, and you certainly shouldn't call it Baldur's Gate 3. The story of the Bowl Spawn is finished. Even if you didn't ascend to godhood and continue to live as a mortal, all your companions got on with their normal lives without you. Throne of Baal concludes with a couple of paragraphs describing each companion's subsequent successes and failures. It's actually pretty touching. 
Bioware couldn't have made it more clear that the story is over. There's those two Dark Alliance games that use the Baldur's Gate name, but I don't plan to cover them in this series for obvious reasons. Ironically, a third game in that series was also planned, but got cancelled due to Interplay's bankruptcy. Let's just accept that Baldur's Gate games aren't meant to reach the number three. The story of Baldur's Gate is incredible. Much of fantasy literature has drifted away from the high fantasy of the Forgotten Realms universe since the release of Baldur's Gate 2. Perhaps it was my own personal tastes, but after reading Game of Thrones back in the early 2000s, I found it hard to go back to the more traditional stuff. I can't have been the only one because within a few years there was a clear move towards grittier fantasy that didn't rely on following a chosen one on the path to their destiny. Joe Abercrombie's First Law trilogy and Scott Lynch's Gentleman Bastard series come to mind. Over time I ended up becoming a little sick of all the doom and gloom and found Brandon Sanderson's novels struck a good balance between embracing cliches and expanding on them in interesting ways. Baldur's Gate reminds me of Sanderson's novels a little. If you condense their stories down to short summaries they sound like they're riddled with tropes, but when you experience the journeys yourself they don't feel predictable, and even if they are you don't really care. And of course as a gamer it was great to play through early Bioware stories and see the tentative introduction of elements such as companion relationships, good slash evil narrative splits, and story endings that are technically different but look much the same and probably left a lot of people disappointed. Baldur's Gate 2 is widely considered to be one of the best RPGs ever made and I can see why. My own personal favourite of the CRPGs I've played in this series is probably Planescape Torment, partly because it was just so different to everything else and had a huge focus on writing over combat. Still, for Bioware to maintain such a high level of quality over 80 hours is a remarkable achievement and a clear sign of things that were to come. Ok, I hope you enjoyed this look back at a classic. Please consider hitting like, sharing the video online and letting me know what you thought in the comments. If you haven't subscribed then please consider doing so and even if you have please make sure that bell icon is clicked so that YouTube actually informs you of new videos. I also have a Patreon page where you can get your name in the credits and a Patreon role in my Discord server for just a dollar a month. The next isometric CRPG retrospective should be Arcanum of Steamworks and Magic Obscura at the end of July. The plan, and I do want to stress the word plan, is to release two lengthy videos in June, both of which are the first games in series that haven't yet been covered on the channel. I'm not going to name them just yet because I'm not sure which will come first and I still have a lot of preparatory reading to do for one of them, hint hint. Alright, until next time, cheers.